without further ado, Daddy D. <laughs> All right, good morning, guys. So it, we're in Genesis chapter 3. Eve was convinced. She saw the tree and it was beautiful. She looked at the fruit and it looked delicious. She wanted the wisdom that she thought this tree of knowledge of good and evil would give her. So she took it, she ate it, she gave some to Adam, and he ate it. And instantly sin entered the world. And along with sin came guilt and shame and blame. And in paradise, everything fell when sin fell, right? And, you know, if you've been around me for a while, you know that when I studied God's word, one thing that the Holy Spirit led me to do was put myself in the story. If I was there, if you were there, if you were Adam, what would you feel at this moment when sin fell and you blamed Eve? How did that go, right? <laughs> what did Eve say? What, and we get a little bit of a highlight of it, but you know it went much deeper. Everything, and the feeling would be, I wish I could go back to chapter two. I wish I could go back in this relationship with my wife, with the relationship with God. I wish I could go, I wish I could undo this and go back to chapter two. What happened in chapter two? Well, God rested, and then it tells us a little bit of the backstory. When he created the animals, he said, He said, Hey, Adam, I'm gonna have you name all the animals. And so that was part of his job. And when they described this, this garden of Eden, it was huge. The Euphrates flowed through it. The Tigris flowed through it. It says there was one section that was just gold and onyx. And then there were various gardens. And when God created a garden, you can imagine how beautiful this garden of Eden was. It's a beautiful place. And Adam's naming the animals and they were walking. He and God would walk in the garden. And the way I picture it is that one day, God says, all right, let's look at what you did today. Um, I'm going to look at these last three animals you named. The, the, the guinea pig. It's not even a pig. You know that, right? <laughs> the fly. Fly? <laughs> Are you tired? Are you <laughs> Shrimp? <laughs> and God said, you know, I need to create you for you a helper, a help me. Someone that can be with you, right? <laughs> and so he does. And he puts Adam into a trance and he takes a rib and Eve's created. Do you know the first thing that Adam said when he saw Eve? Do you know what he said? <laughs> it's in the Bible. He said, at last, <laughs> at last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Do you remember what that was like when you met your wife the first time? And, and you know, you would tell people how happy you are, how great she is, how awesome she is. And then down the road, something happens, and all of a sudden, I can't believe she did that. She always does this. She does. <laughs> and you wish you could go back, right? And you wish you could go back. And that's where we're at in this story. So how do, you know, what do we do when, when, when we're in that situation? What does God have for us? What are our options? What's our part? That's where we're headed with scheme number seven, which we're going to look at today. Our theme verse, go ahead and pull out your bifold. Theme verse is 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. This is the final in our series. Uh, today is Satan's scheme of guilt, shame, and blame. And But just here's what Paul says. I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Well, how are our minds led astray? That's the six schemes that we talked about, which led Eve to the place where she was convinced. But to be clear, Satan can't make us do anything. What he does is he influences our desire. Okay, the anatomy of sin, this should be a key verse for all of us in understanding this. It's in James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire. We're tempted when by our own evil desires he's lured away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, 
when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So we're told that, you know, Peter tells us that be sober minded and alert for your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. How does he do that? How does he devour? Well, Jeremiah, we talked about it last week. Jeremiah makes the comment that we've done, men do two things. We walk away from the fountain of living water, which is God. We lose our thirst for God. And we carve out cisterns that can carry no water at all. We look for something, we desire something else. It's the essence of evil. So what Satan does in all these, that's where he wants us to head to, is lose our desire for God, lose the desire for what God wants us to do, and instead replace it and desire something else that in the end really can't, offer anything. There's a number of, I, I, I'm going to skip these this morning because I, I want to get to this. Uh, I had written down and somehow in my mind, I thought we we're going to have enough time to do this, but there's no way we will. But I put them down. There's other distractions. In week number one, I talked about the fact that, you know, one of the distractions that Satan has that, that's not in Genesis 3 is that he, he wants to divide us. And he does that through unforgiveness unforgiveness. If there's anybody in your life that you haven't forgiven, reflect on what you've been forgiven. That's what God tells us to do. If we know how much we've been forgiven, we can't possibly be bitter toward anybody. If we really know how much God has forgiven us, then that flows out of us. That's, that's the economy that he wants us to have in relationships. We're reflective of him. They know we're his followers by how much we love other people. So, but Satan's going to want to get in there and say, no, 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 you've been hurt so bad. You, you, there's no way you can forgive that. Oh, yes, there is a way you can forgive that because you have been forgiven. The other thing he wants to do is distract us, keep us out of God's word. I'm just going to point to that first one. Distraction's a huge thing. Listen to what Paul says. I'm saying this to your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. I try to picture what were the distractions back that the Corinthian church had. And, I, you know, fact is, for man through all time, there's always something to distract us, right? Today, we've got a boatload. There's a lot of good things we can do. Whether it's coach a team or take up a hobby or, I mean, if you're into sports, we came out of the NFL season right into NCAA, right into baseball starting, into the, now the NBA. But you can watch games every single day, right? <laughs> if you're a golfer, you know how, <laughs> how much time that can take, four hours just to do a round of golf. And if you're working, my brother came in town last week, and uh, it was great seeing him. He saw our house for the first time. We went downstairs to the little man cave, the rec room we put together, and he was walking around. He's looking at the golf trophies. He was. He said to me, "Every one of these is like ten years and older." <laughs> I said, "Yeah." Ever since I started one thing for men, my handicap's gone about seven points. <laughs> but I don't regret it. And in fact, you know, I've, I think I've shared that story. When I was asked to do this, the first thing I thought about was my golf game. You know, am I willing to walk away from golf that much? And so I agreed to do it for three months. That we found somebody else. Because I can get back to playing golf. <laughs> Do I regret it? No. Because of this has forced me to be into God's word. Now I can't wait to get into God's word and put myself in these stories. This is where strength is. This is where power. This is where, and, and when I get to heaven, these characters, I'm going to know them. So realize that part of Satan's scheme is distraction. Okay? Jesus tells a story. The seeds that fell among the thorns are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the worries, the riches, and the pleasures of life. As I examine myself, I realize on Sunday morning, my pastor just brought a great message. And on Monday, I couldn't remember what it was by the end of Monday. Why? Because the worries, the riches, the pleasures, whatever it was, I, didn't, I wasn't basking there. I wasn't allowing God's word to come in. Distraction and being busy with good things but not great things is part of the scheme for us. Okay, let's get back to scheme number seven. Go ahead and, you know, if discouragement is part of what you deal with, if discontentment is part of what you deal with, doubt, dig into these things. Um, table leaders, we're going to skip question one because it refers to what I was going to talk about here. 
But for the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and move forward just on scheme number seven. So go ahead and turn to page two on the bifold. Um, we're going to look at Genesis 3, 7 through 13. I already quoted verse 6. Eve was convinced. She saw the tree, and it was beautiful to her. She looked at the fruit, and it looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom. So she took it, and she ate it, and she gave some to Adam, and he ate it. So now pick up at verse 7. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord and among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid myself. He's guilty. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman that you gave me. <laughs> who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? You know, I almost picture when, when Adam said that, it's, it was the woman and that you, I was fine. It's your idea. To give me that woman. <laughs> I think God just kind of tilted his head sideways and then said, all right, Eve, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied, and so I ate it. Guys, we experience guilt for what we do. We feel shame for who we are, and then we use blame to deflect so we don't put it. Why do we? It's amazing how many things we, we, we blame traffic, right, for being late. We blame the weather for feeling gloomy. Uh, recently, I blamed my car for speeding to a cop. <laughs> it's an electric car. You know, I'm not used to an electric car. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> it did. <laughs> she gave me a break. <laughs> with Sandy, recently, I blamed being short with her on the fact that I'm adjusting to retirement. <laughs> Why do we blame? <laughs> that did not work, no. <laughs> Why do we blame? If we don't blame, then it must, wait, uh-oh. Then that means it's me? If it's me, then I've got something to deal with, don't I? Right. Let's look at this again. We've got sin, we've got guilt, we've got shame, blame took a fall, <laughs> and we got blame, right? Of those four, actually, let's continue it. If this continues, sin comes, we fall, we feel guilty, we have shame because of it, and we blame, right? We can go any way we want, but behind blame, what's behind blame? Why do we blame? We have shame that we don't want to deal with, so we blame, deflect it off. What's behind shame? Guilt. The reason we, fight, we feel shame is because we have guilt. What's behind guilt? The sin that we've experienced. If this is let go, if this, is let, if this continues to run, what follows blame is pain. What follows pain is separation. What follows separation is death. And they all come falling down. And their relationships end. So why there's divorce. This is why sisters don't talk to each other anymore. Neighbors don't talk to each other. Friends that you, something happens. And then when blame comes in, it leads to pain. Leads to separation. Leads to death. Let me ask you, 
the core four. We would all agree sin's not a good thing, right? Blame's not a good thing. Not from God. What about guilt and shame? Are they bad? Are they good? Are they from God? Are they from us? What do you think? Yeah. Guilt and shame. So a lot of studies have been done on the brain. Neuroscience will tell you that when sin happens, there's something in our brain that happens. God's hardwired us this way. We're given a conscience. If our conscience is not dull, when we do something wrong, we're going to feel guilt and shame. Why did God put that there? To bring us to repentance. So that we turn back to him. So we end it here. God's intention, in fact, Jesus put his hand right here and took a nail through it. To stop that right there so that we can turn back around, confess our sins, repent, and come away clean. When we don't do that, where do we turn to? If we turn to blame, you know where the train goes and everything falls apart. God wired us to have guilt and shame. It's like, you know, I drive an automatic. The reason I drive an automatic is the first time I drove a manual, <laughs> it was a jerk stop, right? Because as you know, when you're decelerating, unless you put the clutch in <laughs> and you bring it down from third to second or fourth, what it's going to, the car is just going to jerk stop. That's what guilt, that's what shame does for us. It stops us in our tracks, right? So what happens in a relationship, if we don't take care of this and repent and confess, what happens? Your wife may say to you something unresolved because you have not come clean with that with God. You're still walking with guilt and shame. All she has to do is mention that. And you go, jerk. And what happens? You start blaming something else. Now it goes to pain for her. Now it goes to more separation. That continues. It's a death of a relationship. It's so important that we stop it here. Let's look at what David did. Take a look at your, your bifold on page three. So how does this play out in the Bible? Here's King David. Nathan comes to him, tells him a story. Hey, one of, the, one of the guys in your kingdom, rich guy, has all kinds of sheep, all kinds of cattle. One of his friends is coming, another rich dude. And he went and took the one sheep that his neighbor had and sacrificed that to feed this guy. And David goes, who is this guy? He deserves to die. He's going to have to be punished four times for what he did. And Nathan says, you're the man. What did David do? He fell to his knees and confessed. I've sinned. I've sinned before the Lord God. Here's what he wrote about it. Psalm 51. Wash me clean of my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression. My sin is always before me. My guilt and my shame for what I did is always before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. Godly sorrow led him to repentance. Godly sorrow leads us to repentance. He was on to say, surely you desire truth in the inmost being. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Purify me from the hyssop, with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. <laughs> Here's what Paul says. Write this verse down. I didn't put it on, on the sheet. It's uh, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. We sin, we have shame, we have guilt, we have godly sorrow. It leads us to repentance with salvation, and then there gets no regret. We're washed clean. But worldly sorrow brings death. What's worldly sorrow? Sin, guilt, shame, sorrowful I got caught, blame why I did it, blame something else. I did it because of this, because of this, because of this. That then leads to pain, to separation, and to death. Which way do you turn when you sin? Are you going that way or are you going back to God? John says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Guys, the battle in life is in front of us. Too many men spend too much time battling what's behind us. Why? Because there hasn't been a resolve. Jesus put his hand there and took a spike through it. That's why he did it so that we can become clean for anything that we've done. We don't have to carry, we don't have to fight that battle anymore. He fought it, the battle's been won. Live your life, fight the battle forward. There's things when you hurt people that you have to deal with, but if you get peace here, you can. If you've dealt with your guilt and shame, you can. If you haven't, you're not settled, so you can't. You can't even have somebody bring it up because you're gonna defend. You're going to blame. It's not healthy. Healthy relationship with God ends because there's confession. Okay? Here's the Apostle Paul. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. He put in, he adopted us. He put in us the fact that we want to go back to him. This is so important. Where does Satan come along in his scheme? We're told in Revelation 12, verse 10, his is scheme seven. He brings us into sin, right? He tempts us. He puts out, he influences our desire. Our desire gets inflamed, and we choose something other than God and fall. And then he's right there, day and night, we're told. He's the accuser of the brethren. And he accuses us day and night. He accuses us before God. He accuses us right here. And unless we've taken care of it, unless we've confessed, unless we've turned from that and repented, then we carry it. We carry this guilt and shame. We don't have peace. And a week becomes a month, becomes a year, becomes a decade. And we're not living a victorious life. <laughs> Why does he tell us, hey, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments, right? Because I've given you the power to do that. If you're in habitual sin, you don't love me. You don't love the Father. That's what Jesus said. Where have you not taken care of something? Do you have godly sorrow? That leads to repentance, that leads to salvation, and then there's no regret, and we can live forward. Satan's scheme is to be an accuser. He can't accuse anything that's been wiped clean. And that's what God offers us. Gentlemen, take inventory in your life. If there's anything that you're pricked when somebody brings it up, go back to that point and take it back this way. Confess it, repent of it, wipe it clean. You can talk about it. If it's unsettled and you're going that way with blame, which because of the shame, causing pain, you're not living as you should. You're not reflecting what he's done for us. Don't discount it, okay? Table leaders, I'm going to send it off to you. You can skip right over to question number two. 
and then we'll come back in about 20 minutes. together. Um, I'm going to pull from the floor for just a couple minutes. Anybody, anything that you want to share, something you talked about this morning that was maybe an aha for you that you'd like to share with the room or in the series in general as we're wrapping it up? Anybody? Yep. I'll hit Bob first and I'll come to you, Ed, all right? Uh, oh, Mike. Two things struck me. One is that separation is a revealer. If we feel separated or we know somebody is separated from another person, like my sister and her daughters, that reveals that there was blame, shame, and game before that. And the other thing that dawned on me is, you know, when we have conflict, our emotions can be fight or flight. And that flight piece is separation. And maybe the fight piece should be a really engagement. Engage the issue or separate. Yeah, you know, I've, I've said this many times, but I think it goes back to knowing our identity, knowing that how powerful we are as, as reborn disciples. Uh, but if we don't believe we have authority, if we don't believe we can take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We don't believe we can stay in the light. We don't believe we can be holy like God is holy and Jesus is holy. Be one as I'm one. If we don't truly believe that, we think that's a disingenuous verse in Scripture, then we are falling to Satan's trap of saying you are still human, you're still going to continue to sin because you can't help yourself. That, that's really part of his accusation, right? To say you're not a new creation, you're 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 an old loser, is what you are. And if we're calling ourselves idiots, and we're calling though, though that's where he wants us to be, to put shame on ourselves instead of realizing what we celebrated, what Jesus did on that cross was he's tore the curtain. We have access to the Father. We walk in as priests, as new creations, all new. Um, all right, anybody else? So, so Bill was talking about it. Go back to the triangle as we draw close in God at the top of the triangle. As we go up, draw closer to Him, whether that's in our our marital relationship, whether it's a relationship at work, you know, you know that it, it's designed that way. The closer we get to Him, the smaller our triangle gets. The less the less we can put in it from a baggage standpoint. So, Bill mentioned conviction and condemnation. So, where Jesus comes in and provides the blood to protect us, you know, that's where we turn. So if we sin, we feel guilt and we, we feel shame. We should feel convicted, not condemned because we are forgiven of our sins. If we feel condemnation, our triangle begins to look obtuse where one side of the relationship's continuing to pursue God and the other one's going off to Ackworth. Yeah, so what he's talking about in a triangle there, you know, if it, the, the counsel, you know, if you're, <laughs> Gail came here one time and said, look, I'm not a counselor. And he was, we were working out a, a something, Sandy and I were having an issue. And he said, you know, you're, you're each at the bottom of this triangle. Think vertical, work your way toward God. As you both separately are vertical before him and work your way toward God, you're going to become closer to each other. And then you start accepting all of his forgiveness and you confess and you take the guilt and shame and then the blame out of it. That, that's, that's the recipe for a great relationship. Two people working closer to God, they're going to naturally come closer to each other as they get closer to the top vertically. Sorry. 
just wanted to add one thing. Maybe some of the men here can relate to, um, I've certainly played the blame game. That's very handy in the toolbox to bring out. But I also had a season before my journey was very far along where I, I didn't blame, but I used another parallel to that and I, I called it justification, rationalization, and compartmentalization. And I took it on and said, it's okay if I do it. I can compartmentalize it and I can control it. Nobody else knows about it. I'm not blaming anybody. I own it. I just want to do it. And so I justified it, rationalized it, and compartmentalized it. So it's kind of taking the blame internally and just saying, I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to do it my way. And that's okay. And it's not okay. <laughs> Another dysfunction. Excellent. Excellent. Enoch. We are all here for a reason. We've been given a great opportunity. We are in a church that is filled with the Spirit of God and about the Father's business. We're here in a meeting that God has given to this leader that is a phenomenal teaching. But it does us no good if we come here week after week and we agree with what he says, unless we truly take God's word literally and begin to die to self. We're not uh, just sinners. We're not sinners at all. We're supposed to be saints set apart for God's good purpose. We've been bought with a price. We're not our own. We need to take these teachings and apply them immediately. We're not to be children. We're to be men of God. Ephesians says we're to become mature to the maturity of Christ when he was on earth. Not when we get to heaven, but now to be about the Father's business. It's not our business. It's not what you can make of yourself in this world. It's who you are in Christ. It's about reaching the loss. The time is short, man. These, t these times are beautiful, but it's no good at all. He says, woe unto them who know do right, don't do it. Better they never knew than to know and not do it. We're not doing what God says. We're not being men of God. We're not taking the teachings that come through Hutch and uh, Brother Ron and, and uh, Pastor Chuck and whoever else is leaders over us in the body of Christ in the spiritual realm. We need to be about the Father's business, reaching the lost, reading God's word. In uh, Psalms 119, verse 165 says, Great peace had they who love thy law, his law is his word, his word is his law, for nothing shall offend them nor cause them to stumble. Take that out of the original. Uh, your NIV will give half, King James is the other half. But great peace have they who love the law. Let's love his word. Let's abide in it. And it abide in us. Very good, Enoch. Great. Let me close with this. I, you know, one of the things I'm going to do coming out of this series, this summer, um, I'm going to go through the Psalms again. The Psalms take us to a place where we, we are able to Praise God along with those who wrote, along with those who have gone deep. So David reminds us, while, while Satan is the accuser of the brethren, David reminds us to live vertically. Um, you know, for those of you who go to restoration here, on, you know, in, in our sanctuary, there's a vertical sign. It says this is a vertical church. We're not here horizontally just trying to grow numbers. We're here to please God, to focus on God. The question I asked myself, the question I asked Sandy, uh, and, we, and we talked about this past week, are we living vertically totally? Are we living totally vertically? Or how much of our attention personally is going horizontal versus vertical, even in our marriage? Are we, do are we have a totally vertical marriage? Is there any ways that we, that we are doing anything other than wanting to please him? Um, look at what David wrote. Uh, it's on the back, uh, on page four in the bifold. Oh, Lord... You've examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down and you know when I stand up. If we're living, we've sinned, we have guilt, we have shame. God knows everything about us. He knows where we've been. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to, to say even before I say it. Lord, you go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. Greater is he than in, in us than in he who is in the world. We've been studying Satan. He has schemes. He has a playbook. We should be aware of them. 
we should be wise. We should be, we realize what's going on, but also what we have to realize is our God is greater. Our God has conquered. Our God gives us power for living. We need to live vertically before him. Time in his word, time in prayer, time in confession, time in repentance, time in being clean, and just wanting to live a life for him. And then he gives us his Holy Spirit and empowers us to live that way, right?